Hi, I'm Matthew McLean. I'm the creative lead at Free Studios and the editor of Freespeak magazine. Welcome to this new edition of Art Live. Coming to you from the west side of Manhattan, where Free New York 2023 is about to open at the shed, featuring a tight selection of 70 galleries from New York and across the world, as well as collaborations with local nonprofits and a series of curated artist projects. We're going to take a little wander through the west side before we get to the shed, and we're starting here at the Whitney Museum on the balcony of its amazing Renzo Piano Design building. Here you feel like you're kind of on top of the city with iconic views down to the Statue of Liberty, the Financial District, the streets of Chelsea behind, and the Empire State Building over there. One of the reasons that May is such an exciting time to be in New York is the fair coincides with major museum exhibitions right across the city. And this month that includes uh, former Freeze Artist Award winner Lauren Halsey's amazing pseudo-Egyptian installation on the roof of the Met Museum, a retrospective at the New Museum of the former Deutsche Bank Artist of the Year Award winner Wangechi Mutu, at the Guggenheim, an exploration of young Picasso in Paris, and here at the Whitney, what I think is going to be one of the most talked about exhibitions of the week, which is the first US museum survey dedicated to the New York-based artist Josh Klein. I first saw Josh's work in 2012, when the Gallery 47 Canal presented at the focus section of Freeze London. And it's been really interesting over the last decade to see how Josh has explored some of the same themes again and again, but building in um, ambition and scope. I think the main topic of this survey is really the idea of labor and what technological change will mean for forms of human productivity. One of the best big questions I think it poses is to what extent we as individuals can try to challenge or question certain economic orthodoxies from within a system that often makes us feel powerless or like bit players. So we've walked from the Whitney and we're now in Chelsea, one of the most vibrant gallery districts in the city. And the energy is really buzzy. You can see dealers prepping their Freeze Week shows and welcoming visitors who've just arrived in town, probably for the fair. Galleries are really flocking to New York at the moment. Uh, the Gallery White Cube is going to open a space in the Upper East Side later this year. Just this week, Stephen Friedman Gallery from London announced that it would be opening a space in New York. And they'll be joining galleries like this one, Kuru Manzuto, based in Mexico City, but which opened its gallery in New York uh, just last year, right alongside another newcomer to the city, David Kordansky. For Free Week, Kuru Manzuto is showing the work of Abraham Cruz Villegas, a Mexican artist, most famous to some people for his installation at Tate Modern's Turbine Hall in London in 2016. And we're going to pop inside, talk to Abraham about this show, and catch a sneak preview of his performance he's doing especially for Free Week. This is a, a group of sculptures that, are, that is called Little Song. And I made everything in Mexico City in my studio, and then uh, I improvised in space here in the gallery in New York, trying to test all possibilities in terms of display. In terms of the individual objects um, that make their way into the works, what process of selection happens there? Are you drawn to the kind of formal or aesthetic qualities of these things, or do they carry more of a autobiographical or symbolic value? I deal with things that I find local things that can tell about local economies, local culture, local politics. What I like is that all these objects and materials still change, like us. Transformation is very important. Some of the hanging draped nets in the sculptures actually remind me a little about Otachika's parangoles. Right. So I wondered if you could talk a bit about where this desire to start hanging and suspending and using weight came from. I decided to suspend and to hang things the way of using space, trying to understand through gravity or stability or instability, different ways of dealing with the materials and so. Then sometimes I like understanding this through precariousness, when things are about to collapse, but not only physically, but also conceptually. Like the way I think myself, I'm also about to collapse every time. <laughs> it's another way actually of reminding the viewer of time in a funny way, in that sense of duration. If something could snap at any moment, it brings you into a kind of lived experience. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you get on and prepare for your performance. Thank you very so, much. thank you so much. Thank you. Break thank a leg. You. Thank you for the High Line, the iconic urban park, which snakes its way all the way down from the Whitney up through Chelsea and right outside the doors of the shed. And along the way, it features outdoor public art, including this, its most recent commission, by the Swiss artist Pamela Rosenkrantz. The piece is called Old Tree. It's 25 feet high of polymer coated steel. The artist is trying to refer and engage here to um, different mythological systems that revolve around trees. You think particularly of in Norse mythology, there was the Yggdrasil, the world tree, which engaged every level of reality. 
but by rendering it in this extraordinary pink color that really glows from quite a distance all the way down 10th Avenue as you approach it. The artist, like she does in a lot of her practice, is trying to question what's natural and what's artificial, what's earthly and unearthly. You can also see it's proved really, really popular with uh, selfie takers. Fun fact, Highline Art is created by Cecilia Alamani, who was the first ever curator of Freeze Projects here in New York. And Pamela Rosenkrantz will have a solo presentation that we'll see in a moment in the fair with the galleries Spruth Magas and Karma International. So let's go and check that out and see what else there is to offer on opening day. So now we're here at the lobby of the shed at the entrance of Freeze New York. I'm hearing already this morning people here include collectors not just from the city, but from Dallas, from Miami, from Los Angeles, museum leadership from London, Frankfurt, from Aspen, German soccer legend Mikhail Balak is walking the aisles. So let's go in and see what they're looking at. Good morning, Katie. Nice to see you. I'm glad we both got the heavy metal tie memo. Thank you. I did it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so the gallery recently announced representation of the estate of Carlos Vila, whose work we see here on the stand. Can you tell me about this extraordinary piece that's behind us, please? So this piece is called Kite God. This is iconic of his work from the 1970s. So what this is, it's this like ritualistic cloak that's made of pheasant feathers, rooster feathers, paper pulp, and you'll see the lining is amazing. All of these cloaks, there's 14 known in existence, and most of them have been destroyed. No one knows where they are, or they're in the collection of museums. And so this is one of two that really are available today. So it's kind of, it's not just an artwork, it's sort of a relic of a kind of moment in history. Yeah, it's him. He wore it, and he wore it with pride for what it meant. And hopefully this last cloak can give others hope and be seen by many people. That's the idea today. So you opened Silver Lens's space in New York City last year. Tell me, why was it important to have a space here and, and to come to New York? So we opened in September 2022. We became the first ever gallery from the region of Southeast Asia. It's not just uh, giving our artists from Southeast Asia access to America. It's giving the diaspora in America access to Southeast Asia. And our first opening, we had, it's like not hyperbole, 1,000 people come through for it because it was that monumental for people to see themselves. One of the things that Freeze New York really prides itself on is the platform it can give to local nonprofits. And one of those this year is the Artist Plate Project. All of these plates here were produced in a limited edition of 250 pieces. And as you can see, each one features artwork by a leading modern or contemporary artist. The Artist Plate Project supports the Coalition for the Homeless. So the sale of just one of these plates can provide meals for up to 100 homeless and hungry individuals. And it's really heartening to see how popular this has been today, so much so that the organizers have had to actually erect stanchions to deal with the queues. And notice some of the plates, as this pink dot next to the Ed Rocher marks, have already sold out their whole run. What are some of the um, trends that you're seeing in gallery shows and what's at the fair or what's resonating with you or sort of emerging as something to follow? I mean, it's, it's similar to the last couple of years. You're seeing some incredible historical figures we didn't know a lot about that are brought to the surface and some very exciting young contemporary artists that are you know, having debut shows in New York. And would you say in terms of what your clients particularly have been coming to you for advice on, has that sort of changed over the last few years with kind of economic uncertainty of COVID and inflation and the war, people seeking certain kind of positions? There's definitely been a decrease in urgency, which I think is actually fine. When people rush, they make purchases they regret and we want them to keep these things for many, many years. So we want them to be really sure. I think on the primary market, you still have to kind of be nimble and quick. The good thing about fairs and auctions is that there is sort of a, like a deadline to make a decision and it does create some urgency, which is, you know, it's better than no urgency. <laughs> what would you say in general um, is the most important thing you can impart to a client in terms of guiding them through an understanding of art? Pick an artist you love and buy the best example you can get. There's always going to be something interesting to talk about if you have such a great example. So Freeze New York has a smaller footprint than some of the other Freeze fairs, which means the galleries that exhibit here have to be a little bit clever about their use of space. And I think a really sublime example of this is this presentation by Casey Kaplan, a gallery based here in New York. And as you can see, they've dedicated the whole stand to just one installation by the artist Matthew Rennie, which runs along the back all the way of the stand. It really has space to breathe and it draws the eye as you walk along the aisle. And his forms are simultaneously both kind of 
primordial and also futuristic somehow at the same time. I think what's so impressive about this piece is the way it contains so many disparate elements, but that all kind of hum and throb together in a sort of very consistent way. It almost reminds me of the operations of a system of organs inside the body or a network of fungi slowly communicating with each other underground. So avid watchers of Art Live will remember that in February in LA, we've been looking at the works of Nan Golden on the stand of Marion Goodman Gallery. And here we're seeing the works by the same artists at a different gallery, this is Gagosian. And a few weeks before the fair, Gagosian announced exclusive worldwide representation of this artist who they've decided to showcase here at Freeze New York with this bold presentation of six works. And it's a little bit like a soccer team showing off their star transfer on the first game of a new season, a really ballsy move to show off their talent. And I would say, look at this presentation, Gagosian have really smashed the back of the net. So we're here in the Deutsche Bank Wealth Management Lounge, an area of the fair exclusively reserved for Deutsche Bank guests and clients. And it features this curated display of works from the Deutsche Bank collection, focusing on women's self-portraiture. This includes artists as different as Kate Hardy, Cecilia Paredes, or like this work behind me by the Japanese artist Mia Yanagi. For this series, she invited her subjects to imagine themselves in the year 2050. And as you can see, this particular subject is having the time of her life riding sidecar on a motorbike and smoking a cigarette. Mia Yanagi's work takes over a whole floor of the Deutsche Bank offices in Frankfurt at the moment to really get a flavor of the bank's commitment to art. David Kordansky Gallery have given over their stand to one of the most watched artists of the moment, Lauren Halsey, who, as I mentioned earlier, has this epic installation at the moment on the roof of the Met Museum. Her piece there references the Egyptian Temple of Dender, which is in its entirety shown within the Met, but she's interpreted it through the lens of Afrofuturism, which is this kind of loose conglomeration of events that sought alternative genealogies for black culture and ways of thinking about the future of black life. And what this means in the case of Halsey's practice, in pieces like this amazing incised work on the wall, she kind of connects the language of ancient Egyptian carving, but very much through the vernacular of uh, the LA district of Watts, where the artist grew up and where she's still very passionately involved. So it's a real mixing of different time periods and it feels extremely lively and extremely now. This body of work is sort of a development from the solo show I had at DeRoja last year. And so I'm sort of trying to understand what is the role of images in a society of control how our bodies are and how do we conform our bodies to what we see in images. And with this kind of scratchy quality that really emphasizes the way that an image is rendered into being, like yeah. through a kind of process and almost kind of through a kind of struggle, it feels like there's a kind of... Yeah, and also violence. that the image inevitably has some sort of decay involved in its life cycle as well. It's not like a platonic ideal. So with these wor this work and this work, I actually, after they were finished, I dragged them through the streets of New York by a chain to upgrade the surface. <laughs> Did you ring a bell shouting shame? <laughs> yeah, exactly, just internally. This work is called Joe Flesh, and it's an image of Joe D'Alessandro from the Andy Warhol film Flesh, as this piece is, is a piece of steel, and then I've directly drilled through the image two screws to adhere it to the wall. So the circumstances of it being an image that is on the wall are become part of the image. And also, there's all these little scratches here, which I sort of emphasize because I like having this idea that this thing is getting used. But it also feels a little bit like you've kind of nailed it to a cross. There's something quite easy. Like, yeah, like there's, a, there's a religious quality as well. But yeah, I think the more you debase yourself, the closer to God, you know? <laughs> Amen. Could you say about, you know, the motivation really to come to New York? Since I was a... The, teenager, the magnetism of New York as an artist, you just, I always wanted to be here, so. It's lived up to that dream? Well, it's been a, a dream and a nightmare, you know? <laughs> That's a great description yeah. of New York. So in what at times feels like a sea of lyrical, comforting painting and sculpture, it really stands out when galleries actively and explicitly engage political positions. There were two really clear examples of this on the sixth floor of the shed. Uh, behind me is Dastan's gallery from Tehran, who in the wake of the women life freedom protests in Iran have dedicated their stand to five established female Iranian artists, including works by uh, Nuvek Tavakolian behind me, whose piece documents female singers in Iran. And you should see it's a video work, but with no sound, so the, the singers are being actively silenced. Across the way, Michael Rosenfeld Gallery has given over its presentation 
to create a selection of female artists in its program, exploring women's rights in the wake of the repeal of Roe versus Wade. Of course, the heart of Freeze New York is the art, but there are other experiences on offer too. Here in the Tisch Skylights on the top floor of the shed, a range of the fair's partners are offering different goodies and services, including a new partner at Freeze New York this year, Dr. Barbara Sturm, who is showcasing this whole range of anti-inflammatory skincare, from oils and serums to raw juices to this red light therapy, which I'm going to try in a moment. I hope you've enjoyed our live today at Freeze New York 2023, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Now, make me beautiful. <laughs>